Or do you prefer this microphone? I'm hearing pre preference for this one. OK. So, we, can, we can do both. They're both on. They're both on. Is this even better? <laughs> OK. So I'd love to invite Pam Halpern to help me uh, share some announcements of our upcoming events, as well as introduce our speaker. Thank you, Pam. Uh, thank you, Shani. Um, talk to Okay, all right, all right. Okay, so my announcements. Our next Lunch and Learn will be on April 15th at Van Dusen Gardens. Um, there'll be 11 a.m. guided walking tour, which is optional. And you can just come to the lunch, which will be at 12 at the Shaughnessy Restaurant. I remember we did this last year, and it was a big hit. It was terrific. Um, Thursday, April 18th at 7.30, there's a Shalom Shishim fundraiser with Harriet Frost and the Universal Band at the Rothstein Theatre um, Birthdays and anniversaries. This looks like an incomplete sentence. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Rob Butler. He holds a graduate degree from Simon Fraser University, uh, an MSc, and, the U and at UBC he did a PhD. He's a fellow of the Explorers Club, Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and American Ornithologist Society and an outstanding alumnus of Simon Fraser and Capilano University, and signature member of Artists for Conservation. His research career includes the social behavior of crows, ecology of herons, and migration of birds. Rob is an adjunct professor of biological sciences at SFU and has published over 150 works for scientific and popular audiences. He has scores of appearances on TV, radio, and newspapers. He wrote and co-produced with Mike McKinley two films on nature and culture. So welcome, Dr. Butler. Well, it's great to see all these Crow fans out here. I, I actually want to know how many of you are fans. Okay, hands up if you like Crows. Okay, you, you know what's coming. How many people here don't like crows? Oh, a few of you, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that always happens. You know, I don't expect you to really like crows, but hopefully after this you'll appreciate them a little bit more, okay? Okay. Let's just see. How's that? Did that work okay? Yeah? All right. Okay, so here we are, Society of Crows. I'm going to uh, give you a little outline of what we're going to do here. But before we get too far along, I want to just tell you about our crow. So the crow that's on our coast is known as the Northwestern Crow. Now, a little while ago, they decided that it was actually just a subspecies of the American crow. But ours is actually quite different than the crow that you see across North America. Uh, they're very numerous here in Vancouver, as you know, and they're very boisterous. They have a different call, so they have a much harsher call, and they're smaller. So some people have th thought that this was enough to consider them as a separate species, but right now they're considering it a subspecies. So it flips back and forth, but that's not important. The thing about the crows is that they're very clever. I think probably all of you know this, that crows are very intelligent. In fact, they are one of the most intelligent birds that's out there, and you've probably heard the the comment, the derogatory comment of, you know, somebody is a bird brain. Now, where that arose was almost 100 years ago when they, people were starting to look at brains in animals and they started to look at mammalian brains. And what you find is that in humans and in many of the um, uh, very clever primates and so on, they have the frontal lobes where they make a lot of the rational decisions and where they solve problems. <clears throat> They had a look at the, the crow brain, actually all bird brains, and they don't have that. They don't have the frontal lobes. And so they jumped to this conclusion that birds were just robots out there. They're not very clever at all. Well, as we know, 
from some of the research more recently, that birds are actually very, very clever. In fact, they think, if you look at some of the tests that have been done, that crows are probably about as intelligent as a seven-year-old, a seven-year-old human, to be able to solve problems. So they are very clever. They've got large brains. Their brains are larger for their body size than you'd expect. In fact, the ratio of the brain to the body size is very similar to apes. And there's a good reason for all of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this social brain, and then we'll go on to the family life and the uh, crow rush hour. That's the, going to be the outline of, of the talk here. And at the end of it, of course, there will be an exam. Darcy, you, you're going to get an exam. And uh, if you don't pass it, you've got to come back. Okay. So this brain, this social brain that I was telling you about, the reason that they have this is because these animals, these crows, are highly social. They have to interact with each other. They have to know a, a, an awful lot about the other crows. And as you'll see in the talk, how important all of this is. The brain of the, the crow um, allows them to function as a group. Now, I, you know, we, we often think, you know, uh, we're pretty clever. As probably many of you know, crows can identify themselves. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah they do. They recognize each other. They can recognize the calls and they will respond, depending who it is. They go, ah, yeah, it's just old Joe, you know, make it a big fuss, and they won't react. Or, oh, you know, we would react to this one. So they, they recognize them by the calls and by their facial, um, uh, their, their faces. But they also recognize you, and I think most of you have probably seen that program on uh, television, John Marsalis' work with the masks that they put on, and they realize that they do recognize each other, and they pass it on to their young, so the young know that this is a good person or a bad person. So careful, our own crows. They will learn and remember you for the rest of your life, whether you've been good or bad to them. The reason for this is because they are in a group. They are social animals. And I, I want to ask you, so you, you've recognized everybody here in the crowd. Do you recognize any of the crows? Any of them that come around your house, hang out, you recognize it? Okay, so who's the clever one here? Hmm. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder. But there's a good reason for this, and this is because of this group living. You know, they live together, and they're very, very social. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, little, little bit later on how important this is a life and death thing that they have to do, be able to recognize who are their neighbors, who are the good friends, and who are not. So in terms of some of the studies that have been done on the intelligence, and you've, you've probably seen some of these uh, projects on um, YouTube where they take a tube of water and put the food in it and uh, put some rocks beside it and the crows figure out, you pick up the rocks, drop them in the tube and the water you know, lifts the food and they can get. Um, and, and they've done it with a whole series of tests where they have to be able to solve one problem after another. And it's quite remarkable what the crows are capable of doing and figuring out. So they are very clever, and they, they do rival the primates in their ability to solve these kinds of problems. And one of the problems that we have is that we always equate them to us. We always think you know, an intelligent animal is capable of doing what we can do. And so we give them tests as if they were humans. And this is the problem of trying to find something that is really relevant to those animals to really test that intelligence. But they are very good at solving these problems. As I mentioned, this intelligence uh, is a social necessity. And I want to tell you a little story from last year. So I've been watching crows for a long time. They often get into fights around this time of year when they're nesting. And they get into very vicious fights. Well, the one that we witnessed, my wife and I, um, last year, was a life and death fight between crows. And what had happened is they, it started off as a territorial dispute between two males. All the other crows that were around joined in, and they were all cawing and egging them on. And these two crows were down on the ground fighting. Uh, one of them managed to get the, its uh, opponent onto its back and was just beating the living daylights out of it. It was really vicious. The really surprising thing was that some of those crows that were hanging around got down on the ground and came over and started to jab the crow that was on the bottom, that was the one that was, uh, you know, uh, the, the one that was suffering, the one that was getting attacked. This was a group effort against that crow. 
It wasn't just one-on-one. -on -one. It was a whole community going after that crow. I don't know what it did. The crow managed to get away, tried to escape, had to go over a fence. The other crows knocked it down onto the ground. Eventually, this crow was absolutely exhausted, and it was lying on its back, the wings out, and the other crow was just pummeling it with its bill on the head and the breath. I, I thought it was dead, and I went over to have a look, and it, <laughs> it jumped up, and <laughs> what happened? It flew off with all the crows chasing it, so it survived, because I interfered. But the really important thing about this is this is known as coalitional fighting, and it happens in dolphins, uh, you know, some of the um, uh, primates as well, and it's usually the females that will form these coalitions, but not always. There's a case with crows in captivity where low-ranking ones have got together and evicted the uh, one at the top. I have a friend who's a primatologist who works on baboons and so on, and he said this happens you know, fairly regularly. They, uh, the, the whole community will decide who will be the alpha male. And if they don't like him, and he's not doing the right job, they will gang up and actually kill him. So these are known, this is known as coalitions. And that's why it's so important that the crows recognize each other. That's why they recognize their faces and who they are, the whole community. So th this is, uh, until last year, we thought it was just these little family units all defending their nests and so on. But it looks like there's a whole community that is out there saying, we like the status quo. We don't want this to change. Uh, I have on the bottom there a little bit about nut cracking and tool use, too. You, as I mentioned, you can look at all these um, videos on YouTube with the tube use. They, the uh, New Caledonian crow is the one that's sort of the, the best of the best. Uh, it lives in New Caledonia Island. And it creates, uh, out of the petiole off a leaf, it creates a, a little hook that it uses to pull grubs out of holes in the wood. And there's left-handed and right-handed ones. And uh, once they've got it made, they carry it around with them like a little tool, and they use this. So they're very, very good at it. This is the crow that they've done a lot of experiments with to, just to see how clever they are. They give them a piece of wire in a cage, and the crow will bend the wire to make the hook. You know, it's, it's, just have a look on YouTube. Um, but I want to mention to you about this nutcracking business. This is really fun. You've probably seen crows around town, and they take nuts, they fly up and drop them on the road and crack them open. In Japan, there's a crow that does this as well. And for a long time, it was just you know, dropping them on the road until one day, one of the crows realized that if you leave it on the road and let the car run over it, you don't have to drop it. You can see this, this is on YouTube as well. So the, the crow, what it does is it waits for the light to change, goes out, puts the nut there, flies back, waits for the traffic to go back and forth. When the light stops, flies out and gets the nut. Okay, so he's got to figure it out. And what they discovered is uh, the fellow that's doing it, uh, Hirohito Higuchi, he was studying this, these crows, he realized that it was being um, picked up by other crows. And it was largely the young crows that were picking it up. And he was tracking it to see how fast it was spreading, because this is a cultural transmission. It's not something they, they're inheriting. They're learning to do this. And he was looking at how fast something like this would pass through a culture and become part of what crows are doing. He wrote this uh, quite a while ago, so I got back to him and I asked him, how far has it gone? And he said, he doesn't know what happened, but they've stopped doing it. He thinks the original crows that were doing it had died, and it just wasn't being passed on. He wasn't sure what it was, but it was, it was such a great story to watch it. You, you can see it on YouTube. So this is an example of these crows, you know, their ability to solve problems and uh, uh, you know, uh, identify one another and um, how important it is in their social life to uh, recognize each other. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. I'm going to take you on a little trip. Uh, this is a, um, an island where I did my crow research, and if you can see the, the map there, it's Middle Natch Island. So it's right up in the northern end of the Strait of Georgia, up near Campbell River. And there's this little island, it's a provincial park, um, and uh, there's a, a lot of seabirds that nest on it, and of course, lots of crows. So, when was this, 1972, 73. My wife and I went out and started to work on the crows. 
At that time, it was a very remote island. We didn't have, of course, cell phones or any kind of communication. We just had to get in the boat, take our supplies, and go live on the island. So this is where we lived. <clears throat> this was a little cabin that was built mostly out of driftwood, a few uh, windows pounded into it. And this is still there in, in the provincial park. And uh, people go out and spend a week or two uh, on the island. You can do this as a volunteer. And you can live among the birds. So you've got a couple of thousand nesting gulls. You've got all the crows, oyster catchers, cormorants. Uh, it's uh, full of... Um, uh, sea lions and seals now. It's just alive. And if you want to really get close to nature, this is a great place to do it. I wanted to do it on the island because it was contained. The crows would just be on the island. They're not interacting with people. They're just doing their thing. And so this is where I conducted my, work, my research. So this is what it looks like for a crow. So um, there's three main habitats for them where they, it's uh, important to them. So the, uh, the pink one is the beach. So when the tide goes down, there's all that intertidal food, all the crabs and clams and everything, the fish, they're all available to the crows. There's the meadows where they feed largely on insects and spiders and snakes. They even go after snakes. And then the nesting colonies where the gulls are, uh, the gulls, when they're bringing food back, they spill a lot of it, and the crows go in and scavenge this. If there's an eagle that comes over, uh, the, the gulls will regurgitate their food, and then the crows are very quick to take advantage of that. So these are the important places for them where they were feeding. So here, here this is way back in 1976, I think I took this, uh, the gull nesting colonies. Uh, if you're up close, you might be able to see all the gulls. So they, they each have a nest, they have three eggs or they're young, and uh, think of this, the island covered in about 2,000 of these. It's just alive. And the meadow at that time, this is what it looked like. So I would sit up on the horizon there and I could see the crows coming and going, doing all their thing. Oh, I, I have to tell you a little fun story here. One of the things that we do as ornithologists, we always want to be able to see up close what's taking place in nests. Birds in general aren't very good at counting. And so there's a trick that we do. We build this little thing called a hide or a blind, and it's just like a little canvas cube. Uh, and you, you put it fairly close to the nest, and then as the bird gets used to it, you just move it closer and closer and closer until it's right up beside the nest or close to the nest. And you can sit inside this, and the bird doesn't know you're there. The trick is two people go in, one person comes out, and the, crows, uh, the birds can't count. Well, crows can. So I tried this. It was just my wife and I, and of course, they can, I, think the, I think the crows can probably count to at least seven. So, you know, two people go in, one comes out, the crow says, I know you're still in there. So it didn't really work. And it ended up, I was sitting in this, I got it, I waited till the, the, the crow was gone, and I snuck in, sealed it all up, and I was sitting inside thinking, I've outsmarted this crow. And it was getting hotter and hotter, and it's all canvas, you know, it's hot. So I opened the door, so I, whew, I air it out, and here's the crow sitting there, right at the door. He's in there, he's in there! <laughs> Get out! <laughs> so I realized, okay, this isn't gonna work. So instead I sat up on the hill here with a telescope and watched the crows and spent hours and hours watching them coming and going, and that's where a lot of this story uh, comes from. The other place that's really important, of course, is the beach, and this is what it looks like back then. Um, all that white is uh, oysters. Yeah. <laughs> And the crows, of course, nested across the island. And we had two, you could kind of divide them into two. The, the beach crows, the ones that nested along the beach, the ones at the waterfront, and then the other crows that are up on the hill. And uh, the crows, uh, in all of these locations where they would build their nest, uh, they would defend an area around the nest to keep all the other crows and um, any um, potential predator away. You can see this going on right now out here. The crows are building nests, and you'll see them on the ground like this. And you just look for this one. You see, see how the head, the feathers are all ruffled up on the head? That's sort of like, look, you can go any closer. and you, it's, it's that kind of mild threat. It's a threat, but it's a mild one. Gradually, if it's getting really escalated, you'll see the tail come up, and the wings will go down, and then you'll see a fight. Those are quite rare, but you'll see crows doing this all the time and they're just trying to dominate the, their neighbors. So they keep them away from the nest. 
and each one of the uh, crows then has a territory. So here we are, this is how the island was divided up um, back in the 70s. All these light pink areas are the um, territories, and you can see the nest, the, the triangles. So those are the ones all along the edge of the beach, and then up on the hill are all those light green ones. So we have the sort of the hill crows in the green and the beach ones in pink. Now the importance for this is that a crow that nests up on the hill has to come down to the beach to feed. And by the end of the breeding season, they put in about 180 kilometers more in flight, going back and forth to get food up to their young ones. And this is a really important point here. So this is what it turns out is that the hill crows, they own pretty poor real estate and the beach crows had the, the best spot. So you can imagine what goes on now. Everybody wants some waterfront. <laughs> the nesting season is pretty much divided like this, and this is the same here in Vancouver. So right now, you can see in March, uh, it's the nesting season, and you'll see the crows with the twigs. You just follow them. You, they'll go back and they'll show you where the nest is. Or if you're just driving around town, when you leave, just go around and look at all the trees that have no, tree, uh, no leaves on them, and you see a big clump. That's a crow nest. And they're not very high up. You know, they're, they're easy to see. By um, April uh, and into May, they'll be laying eggs. And then May and June, they have nestlings, and then they have these adolescents. And the crows have a very, very long period of time when they're looking after their young. This is unusual in birds. Usually once they're out of the nest, a week or so goes by and they're independent. With crows, it's the other way around. They look after their young ones at least for that length of time and perhaps longer. So they're like primates and it's like us. We have a long period of time of having adolescence. Maybe a little bit too long. So here's what it looks like in May and June. So you can see the eggs are laid. That's what they look like. And here's some little, little ones who have just come out, hatched out, like little dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. You know that. Huh? They evolve from dinosaurs. Yeah. Right? <laughs> It'll be on the exam. OK, so <laughs> uh, about a week later, you know, they're, they're naked and helpless. And here they are begging away. And they, they don't recognize me when I came, came to the nest. Uh, their eyes are just starting to open up, and if you jiggle the nest, the heads go up, and they're begging for food. And then uh, the parents are busy doing this. So they're spending about three quarters of the day looking for this, trying to find food. And uh, many of the skills that they use are culturally transmitted. They're not inherited. They have to learn from each other. The parents teach their young how to get the food. And the ones that are efficient at doing this will raise enough, will be able to raise young. If they're not good at it, it has serious consequences. So here's what goes on on the beach. So a crow, on the top right there, you can see it's down digging a clam. And then it uh, takes the clam in its bill, flies over to the rocks and drops them. And I noticed this, that you know, on the beach, all these shells were a historical record of what the crows ate, the size of the clam. So I took a whole pile of these things and measured them all up. And then I went out onto the beach and dug up a bunch of clams. And you realize the crows are really selecting a certain size clam. They're not taking any old clam. And you could see them. They will dig them up and they'll discard some. They're picking a certain size. Oh, that's interesting. How do they do this? So here we are. This is what it looks like. You can see the cracked shell. That's one they just dropped open. And there are all the discarded shells. So for the crow to, get to make this all work, it has to get the clam, dig it up, fly it to the beach, drop it, and crack it open. And this is where the learning comes in. So if they, they know the, the right height to drop it, they do it once. They fly up, drop it, crack. The young ones, they're not very good at this, and they drop them often too low, and it bounces, doesn't crack, and they do it over and over and over. And then they get really frustrated, and they go up high, and we're going to crack this thing open, and drops it. But by the time it does it, another crow flies in and steals it. So they don't get it. And they're very inefficient. It takes them over a year to be able to become as efficient as the adults. And so that's one reason why crows don't breed until they're uh, two years or more, often three or four years of age. They have to learn to do this and they learn it from their parents, and it's why they have that long adolescent period after uh, coming out of the nest. 
Now, seeking the right clam was really interesting. Howie Richardson uh, actually looked at this as part of his uh, graduate work, and uh, he discovered that, sure enough, there are clams that are too small, and there are ones that are all around, cracked around on the beach that are just the perfect size. And then there's some big ones, and they get a really big one, they go and cache them, eat them on the high tide. And what Howie did is he thought, you know, each one of these steps of, for the crow, flying to the beach, looking for a clam, digging it out, flying it to the rocks, cracking them. Each one of these costs some energy and time. And he thought, if they must know that if they take a small one, they're not getting enough energy out of it. It's too small. It's like you're going up to the lunch th uh, uh, table here and taking some little tiny thing. You know it's not enough. To, you, you need a little more for lunch. You kind of know intuitively. And he found that they were absolutely fantastic at choosing the, the, the optimum size. And he experimented with it. So he instead provided them with the clams and adjusted the, the size that he estimated the size of the clam they would take. And sure enough, the crows made the calculation and took a slightly smaller clam because they didn't have to go dig them up. And then he cracked them open for them and he looked at it and the same thing happened. They went for smaller ones and he realized that they were very, very good at this. So how do they do it? How does a crow make this calculation. They obviously have to learn over time what is the right size. I think it's probably the weight, the weight of the clam, and they do it over time that this is one I know I can drop and crack open and get the right amount of food. But this is what it's like to be a crow. You've got to learn all these tricks to, uh, to be able to nest and breed. Okay, now this is something we just discovered which is really, really cool. I had a look at a bunch of crow nests around um, on Middle Natch. I was visiting them on a regular basis every few days. And I noticed that oftentimes there'd be a pale egg. You notice that one down there? This is in the Beatty Museum. But, but you notice that's a, a really pale one. Sometimes they're a different color. Like they're greenish, whereas the rest of them are blue. They're a different color altogether. And I wondered about that, like why would they do this? We had a look at it and we found out that three quarters of the time when eggs go missing from nests, it's that one. And the crows are stealing their own eggs. So the neighborhood crows, the neighboring crows, are trying to get into the nest and steal the eggs. This goes on all the time. And it's why those crows are so aggressive and that fighting I was telling you about and the displays and why they hold that territory. That territory is how far they can chase another crow away. And it's the size of that territory is determined by this. And the really interesting thing is that um, females, when they start to lay eggs, they beg to their, to their males to bring them food. You'll hear it. it. It'll start maybe next week or the week after. And they'll be in their nest and they go, eh, eh, eh. If you hear that, you know it's a nest. What I think she is doing is she's testing her mate. She's saying, if we are going to raise all these kids, I'm not doing it on my own, honey. You know, you're going to have to come and help. So you get out there and show me. You know, show me that you can do this. And if he's not very good at doing this, she says, well, I'm doing this because I'm going to, I have to come off and find food myself and we're going to lose an egg or two. I'm going to make sure it's the last one I lay. And that's it. That's the last egg that's laid. It's also smaller and it's done as an insurance. And most times that egg disappears sometimes more. In fact, among the crows, half the nests are lost. Only half of them actually raise any young at all. So that's pretty clever, isn't it? It's not clever. I mean, they've, they've obviously evolved to do this. Other birds do this too, and they will lay uh, different colored eggs. There was a fellow, Yoram Yomtov, he's from Israel, who, who uh, looked at uh, uh, carrion crows, and he tested this whole idea by feeding the females. He gave the males food so he, they could take them up and feed their females, and they didn't lose their eggs. So that was sort of a bit of a test of that. It was kind of cool. So th this is what we think is going on. Um, one la last little bit. I mentioned to you about the crows taking those big clams and caching them. We often thought it was just, you know, they're waiting till the high tide and there's no food around and they would cache it and eat it then. No, the male is doing this on the high tide, so he has food to feed the female who's on the nest. The best thing is for her to stay on that nest as long as possible, and if he can keep feeding her, 
They aren't going to lose their eggs. They're not going to lose the insurance egg. It's all good. So they've done this. They've cashed, they've cashed this, and uh, Paul James and Nico Verbeek had a look at this on Middle Natch at caching, caching behavior by crows. They take these clams, uh, uh, and they fly up onto the, their territory. They dig a little hole, and they bury it, put a leaf or two over it, and then they watch them to see. And 99% of them are taken the next day, and the crows fly directly to where they buried them. They don't look around for it. They know exactly where it is. I've gone up on the hillside and looked around. I can't see where they buried them, but they remember where they've done this. They've done a lot of work on this caching thing among other uh, corvids. Corvids are the jays, magpies, uh, ravens, and so on. And one of the best ones is the pinion jay from the, down in the, the southwest. Like its name implies, it eats pinion seeds. They go out and they harvest these seeds, and then they bury them, and then through the winter they come back and get them. But they do this in the mountains. So just think about this. You know, you're a jay, you've got all, this, you've got all your food, <laughs> and it's all stored out there in the forest, and then it snows. <laughs> the jays are able to go wherever it is and dig down in the snow right to the cache. How they do this is really remarkable. So a colleague of mine did a little experiment. <laughs> he got a, a great big trailer and filled it with kitty litter, and he had some captive pinion jays. He gave them the food, and off they flew uh, and buried these. And then he took, brought the jays back a week later, and they got virtually all of them. And then he brought them back a month later, and they got virtually all of them. So then he tested his graduate students. <laughs> They weren't very good at it. They couldn't remember the next day where they were stored. This is something, of course, that's inherited. And now we know from caching in birds is what they do is they have a mental map in their heads. And at the end of the breeding season, or end of the um, winter, when they no longer need it, they empty the, the, the hard drive. <laughs> they get rid of all the memory, and it's all gone. And then they start over again, and they create a mental map. Chickadees do this. They create a mental map of where everything they've stored. And that's how, how the brain works. And same with, uh, with these crows. They remember exactly where they are. It's pretty neat, isn't it? OK, one other little aspect about this is crows, you can imagine if you're going to lose eggs, it might be useful to have a helper. Maybe have somebody else as a guard around your nest. Well, the crows. Um, often get help from the previous year's young. If you get a nice sunny day, have a look at the crows, and if you see one that has sort of a brownish cast to the feathers, that's a yearling. So it's from the previous year. Or if you see three crows flying around together and seem to be getting along OK, one of them is probably the kid from the, the previous year. And what happens is with these helpers is they hang around the nest and chase off all the other crows. So you've got three who are guarding the nest rather than two. So if the female comes off the nest, the helper can be there and just guard the nest. So these ones that have helpers do far better than the ones that don't. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So they got the egg, the insurance egg. They've got the caching, you know, when to cache food. And now they have the helpers. OK, this is really high tech. <laughs> so we have two territories here. The one on the top is a, a pair of crows with a helper, and the other ones on the bottom are uh, a pair of crows without. The beach is here. You can see all the clams and crabs. Yeah, I, I know it's not very high tech. But. So tide goes down. One of the crows goes down to feed. It's going to go have you know, down at the smorgasbord. Then it, the next one comes down. They're having a good time down there getting clams, cracking them on the rocks, all that kind of stuff. And then the neighbors do the same thing. <laughs> You can see what's going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. Bingo. <laughs> and uh, the egg is gone. So that's the problem. You can, by having the helper, that doesn't happen as often as not having the helper. The helpers will call to the parents and say, hey, come and give me some help. There's some crazy guy trying to get the eggs. And they'll come up and chase them off. And so it's, they are more successful. So by uh, June and July, the chicks are nearly ready to fly. And the ones by the beach, this pair that we were watching, and you can see it has four young. This was taken in 1976, so it's kind of faded. But they had four young. Uh, they had helper. 
and uh, they were able to raise four young. And there's even one that was on the ground. Some of them nest on the ground on the island, and they were able to raise three. So they're doing really well. Well, the hill crows, they were lucky if they even had one young in their nest. They were flying down to the beach and back, and because they were away from the nest for so long, they were losing their eggs. Now, you may wonder why they do this. Why, why go and steal the eggs off each other? The, what the uh, research is indicating is that when this happens, often there's a divorce. The pair will split up and abandon the site. And so there's a bunch of crows out there that haven't got a nest site, and this is their best tactic. They've only got a few years. They live to be maybe 12. In the first two years, they're learning how to be a crow. Then they got to find a territory, so they end up with maybe you know six or eight years if they're lucky to nest. Half of them, half the nests fail. They're really desperate to find a spot. So they go in and steal the eggs, try to get them to abandon so that they can get a chance to start it. And of course, the ones holding the nest are fighting back. So this is the tension that goes on in the, in the crow world. So fledgling is a uh, dangerous time for these young ones where they, uh, they come out, they get attacked by eagles. Uh, a lot of times they, they're taken in the nest. So around here in Vancouver, you'll see the eagles come in and land on the tops of the trees with all the crows going around. The eagles are taking their young. Uh, the ravens are trying to steal their eggs and their young. So they have a really tough time. If they nest at the top of one of these big trees, the eagles get them. If they nest at the bottom of the tree, the raccoons get them. And so it's, they're trying to find that spot that works. When they come out, this is what they look like. The, the eye is changed, you know, this one. But they often have blue eyes for the first week. And they have that pink lining in the mouth and almost like a concave forehead. So this is a fledgling, just, just uh, come out of the nest. And uh, when all this takes place, this is when <laughs> this is when we start getting all the phone calls. <laughs> You've seen all the stories, and I think some of you have been uh, the recipients of crows dive bombing on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just that the parents are good parents. Their young ones aren't able to fly very well in the first week, and so the parents are trying to drive you away. All you have to do is avoid that nest, and in a week or 10 days, it'll all be over. They're just good parents. They're just doing what crows do. So. Keep that in mind. They're not attacking you, per se. They just want you to get you away from their, their nestlings. OK, so to summarize then, those crows that are on the beach, uh, some of them have yearling helpers. They're, of course, close to the food. Uh, they spend less time away from the nest. And they raise lots of young. The hill crows are the opposite. They have very few helpers. They're farther from the food, spend more time away from the nest, and thus raise fewer offspring. So after all this, you know, you think all this tension between the crows and they're fighting and they're trying to steal eggs and <laughs> all the things they do. When an enemy comes through, they all of a sudden become pals and they form this confederation, confederacy to chase them out. And you'll see it around town with a, a raven or an eagle with all the crows in pursuit and they want to get them out. That's where the neighborhood gets together. And you'll see 20 or 30 crows doing this and they're all saying, get that thing out of, this, out of the neighborhood and chase it on. So um, they do have to know who each other is. They have to recognize the calls. When, when an eagle is coming in, they give a higher pitch call. It's a like, caw, caw. When it's a, rave, or it's a raccoon or something on the ground, it's lower, caw, caw, caw. And they recognize this. And they, so if it's a raccoon, well, there's nothing they can do. But if it's an eagle, they all rally. And they'll chase them out. So to summarize on all of this stuff, so finding uh, food requires a, a lot of skills. It's culturally transmitted. Uh, they de defending the nest takes a lot of diligence. So you'll be seeing this all through the spring and summer now. The crows will be on their territories and be very aggressive towards each other and eventually towards you. Um, and thwarting predators requires that cooperation. Working together can uh, be a real benefit. I want to take you to New Westminster. This is where, where I live. And during uh, COVID, we started to uh, do our walks around the neighborhood. And being sort of a, a crow nerd that I am, I decided to you know, note where all the nests were, keep track of them, and kind of get back to what I was doing at the start of my career. And so we noted down all the locations of these nests, where they were building, and what they were doing, and all of that sort of thing. And uh, so every day or two, we do our loop and keep track of all these crows. And uh, 
this is in my office here, so I had one up in a tree up there, right at the top of that cedar tree. I had the telescope on it, and as I'm working away, I can say, oh, there's the crow, and I can keep track of some of the stuff it was doing. Uh, it lost its nest to eagles, because it's right at the top. And these silly crows, I saw them there yesterday, building the, in the same place. I mean, they just didn't learn. They're going to lose it again. It's just too high up. But anyway. So here's a, a more typical one. Uh, this is a, you can see how low it is. So this is what you look for. Just go look around the trees out here, and you'll see these nests. Um, and they, um, this one was uh, taken care of by a crow that injured its wing and hangs, right, so I, I can recognize it. He walks around, so we, we call him Droopy because he's got this droopy wing. And uh, Droopy, oh, he's really tough. And uh, he had a helper, a yearling helper, and they managed to raise three young last year. So good for Droopy. <laughs> But here we are, this is the, the area, so this is, uh, if you know New Westminster, 10th and 8th are the boundaries on either side of it, and it goes from Columbia Street up to almost to McBride. And uh, so there's all the nests, and you can see there's a lot. Now, take that, spread that all over Vancouver, <laughs> and get an idea. There's a lot of crows. They're not very far apart. Uh, it's usually where there's a nice nest tree. That's where you'll find most of them. And uh, yeah, there, there's lots of crows. So if we compare them, look at the nesting success of the ones in the country, the ones out at Middle Natch, and the ones that are in the city, they have the same nesting season, of course. They have the same size territory. They have the same nesting success. About, about half of them succeed. They have helpers. So they're all pretty much the same. Even though they're in very, very different environments, there's no seashore here. There's no nesting gulls. They go down to the shopping malls. And like the ones that are closest to the beach, do the best, the ones closest to the shopping malls do the best. It's the same, same pattern, just different food. So this is uh, uh, one of the crows that we, we know, and uh, the female and the yearling up, up behind. So crow society then is based on these family units where they have a, a nest with their territory, and uh, some of them have help from the previous generation, the, the helpers. Uh, cooperation is, goes on within the family and the extended family, and it is a culture of thievery. And I think, that, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I think this is why people relate so closely to crows. <laughs> uh, underneath it, you know, our society has a lot of thievery and cheating that goes on too, and we do all kinds of things to counter it. And you kind of equate to some of the things that the crows are doing, and you think, well, maybe we can learn something from them. <laughs> and uh, they also, um, as I mentioned, there's, there's food caching that goes on. So they have a sense of the future. They understand this. They can anticipate what's going to happen in the future. And they also uh, harvest food communally. So they go down onto the beaches and they feed on clams together, but they have a territory that's exclusively theirs. So it's very complex. There's this stuff of being very cooperative, there's times when they're very communal, and then other times when they're exclusive and nobody's coming near it. So it, in a way, it's like our society. We have similar kinds of reactions to things. So. Okay, last bit here. This is the rush hour. Now, I, I imagine most of you have seen the crows going down to the roost. Has anybody been to the roost? Yeah, you've been, okay, so you know, yeah, you know, okay. Um, the um, crows in the evening will leave uh, their nesting areas uh, and, and uh, go down to a, co a communal roost, a common roost. The roost, yes. So the, the, uh, they go very early in the, in the um, at late afternoon, and um, and then they're late to, to return. This is very unusual for birds. Most birds go uh, individually. They sit by where they're going to roost, and they wait until it's just about dark, and then they poof, go into the shrub or wherever they're going to roost. The crows are the complete opposite. They all go down as a big gang. They make a big hullabaloo. They all arrive early. It's very, very different. And this is the location. So where, where you're going is um, you go along Highway 1, and uh, Still Creek Drive. Still Creek Drive. So 
on the uh, right-hand side of the star, there's a big Costco and, and the keg. Uh, uh, Brentwood Mall is just up the hill slightly from it. And uh, there's a McDonald's right there. And you can park in the McDonald's lot and you'll be r right beside the roost. And they roost along the roadside, you know, in, in all the trees. So it starts just around, you know, when it's starting to get dark, and you see a few crows come in, and then a few more, and a few more. You, you know it. <laughs> you know what happens. And then the tsunami arrives, and 13,000 crows all arrive, and it's just pandemonium. It is just unbelievable. Uh, if you get a bit spooky about things like this, you might want to go with a friend. <laughs> but it, it's just absolutely a, a, an amazing sight. So there's a little bit of a stream, this is Still Creek, and uh, the crows are all in the trees around there and all around the light industrial um, area along Still Creek. So this is Still Creek Drive. There's McDonald's, and this is uh, Willington. So just come along the highway, highway one, take the exit, go across and then around, park in the McDonald's parking lot, and you can just go for a walk. If you want to go, you know, I could arrange a, a, a visit and you can go down and have a look. It, it's just absolutely crazy to, to see this. And it's such a great spectacle, you know, here in Vancouver that we have it. They used to roost out, outside the city. And uh, my wife and I were following them through the 70s. And um, they were going out to Boyer Island off Horseshoe Bay. Uh, there weren't as many, there were a couple of thousand. And then one night they stopped. And we wondered what was going on. So we went looking for them the next night. And instead of flying along the, coming from UBC and coming across uh, through West Van, they reversed their, their course. We followed them back and found them at BCIT. And so we have the date, and it was in 1973, I think it was. So they've been there ever since, and it's grown. The, uh, the number of crows is related to the amount of suburban sprawl. So as, as we put in sprawl, we're actually making crow habitat. And so the number of crows has grown a, a little bit in Vancouver, but out in the valley, there's a roost with 55,000 crows, massive thing. And there's lots of other ones in other places. I'll, I'll take some questions in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is a, an important thing for them. And so you wonder, like, why do they do this? Uh, coming all the way from UBC and flying out there, it takes them you know, close to half an hour to make the flight. They come from Port Moody, from uh, Richmond, the North Shore, and they all converge at that one location. Um, and they come in in these big groups. You wonder why. I, I watch them go by my place. I have a flight path. I've seen up to uh, close to 5,000 go by. Yeah, I count them. Yeah. <laughs> they, they fly by uh, in the evening and go down to this, this place to, to spend the night. I, I think the reason is because of owls, the great horned owls in particular. Great horned owls like to uh, kill crows, eat crows. They have a characteristic uh, habit of lopping their heads off, so you know if there's been a great horned owl around. Uh, there's very few great horned owls in this area, of course, and I think that, at least I thought that's what it was. I, you, know, you know, you watch this, the crows always throw, throw a twist. I had it all figured out. I looked at the distribution of owls, looked at crows, and thought, yeah, this all kind of works. That might be it. Then I went to Haida Gwaii. I watched the crows go to the roost, and I realized, there's no great horned owls on Haida Gwaii. Hmm. So they're still going to roost. So it's still open why they're doing this. But I think it's to do with safety. And that's why they arrive early and make a big noise. If there's a predator in there, they'll get them out. And they'll have a nice safe place for the night. So that's a real spectacle. We're very fortunate to have that. Um, and I, you can put it on your calendar to go down and see it. The best time is through the winter. Uh, now when they're starting to nest, some of them are hanging out more out here and on their territories, so the numbers will go down. But um, from October till about now, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You, you gotta forget about Netflix and things. Just go and see the crows. So here's what it looks like. See, all the crows are all lined up, ready to go. They arrive at sunset, make a lot of noise. They perch just before dark, and like I mentioned, uh, there's very few uh, great horned owls there compared to out in the country. So then, in summary, the uh, crows are very intelligent, as you now realize, and, and they're very social. Uh, they have a culture of thievery, thieving from each other and from other animals. They have helpers at the nest, and they roost in these very, very large numbers. 
So with that, I'm going to take some questions. And I also want to mention I've got a couple of upcoming talks, if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to do one which will be a lot of fun at Van Dusen Gardens for World Migratory Bird Day, which is uh, May the 10th. And it's going to be bird facts and fiction, all kinds of uh, goofy stuff. Um, you know, the, um, do you think storks bring babies? Come to the talk. There's data. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, the other one, uh, the second one, uh, How Gardens Inspire, uh, this is to do with a novel that I just finished writing called Letters from Gerald. It's about a young woman in post-war um, England who um, aspires to become an ornithologist at the British Museum of Natural History. Now, I spent quite a bit of time in the UK uh, working on bird conservation, and so I decided to make this crazy story. I woke up one morning uh, early, and my, when my wife woke up, I said, do you want to hear a story? Uh, she, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I started to tell her this story about Eleanor and how this all goes. So every morning would be a new chapter, and we would talk about the plot and all that. Anyway, it's coming out in May, and uh, I have a few bookmarks here if you're interested. And I'm going to talk about it down there at Van Dusen Gardens, uh, to, uh, about how gardens kind of inspired all of this uh, uh, crazy stuff, writing novels and so on. So with that, I'll... Uh, Start to take some questions, because I know there's always questions. Everybody has a crow story. So thank you very much. OK, there we go. There we go. Questions, yes. It might be a good idea to suggest to people they carry an umbrella if they're in the vicinity of uh, crows that dive bomb you, because uh, yeah, it's that, good that's protection. a good point. Yeah, 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 or or a hat, or even what we used to do is put a stick, just put a stick up because they can't oh. hit your head. But you look kind of goofy walking around with a stick out of your. <laughs> I have never heard you say anything negative about crows. Is there anything negative? Oh, no, no, it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's uh, so Lots of people don't like crows and because of the aggressiveness. There's that. Uh, they also go after chafer beetles in the lawns and tear them up. But, you know, that's what they do. That's, uh, they feed on grubs naturally, so it's, it's a natural thing for them to do. So um, I just find these animals, I find all animals fascinating. And uh, it was interesting. I was reading this book when I was actually doing this novel. There's a, a fellow named David Lack who was an ornithologist at, at Oxford. And way back in 1947, he wrote a little book for the public called uh, The Life of the Robin, you know, the British Robin. Robins are, are very territorial, and they go after, the males go after each other. And that orange breast is the signal. It says, I'm a territorial holder. And all you have to do is have that color, and the robins will attack it. And so he did a bunch of experiments where he gave them stuffed ones. And he, it came down to it was just a few feathers, and it would elicit this response. The, the general response from people is, you know, these robins aren't very smart. They must know. And he had a really interesting thing. He said, you know, the animals will have a very different perception of the world than ours. And we may not fully understand it. It's like the dogs, what they can smell or what cats can hear. We don't understand this at all. And they may actually see the world very differently and have a very different world view. And I've taken that to heart on this. That the crows will have a different world view than mine, obviously. And I just find it, you know, the more we get into it and learn about it, the more I can appreciate it. Plus, after 50 years, we're still learning new things. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, why do the crows, or why do all of these birds go to the roost? What's the reason? What do they do there? Well, I, I mentioned that. I think it's because of the um, great horned owls. If they yeah, decide... What do they do when they get there? Oh, when they get there. Why do they go? Well, I think by making all the... Together? No, I think by making all the noise, if there was an owl in there, they will chase it out. Now, when I was on Middle Natch, it was interesting that you should raise this. Um, the crows come from other islands and roost on Middle Natch Island because it was a safe place. And one year, uh, they, they, they didn't come. And I was really puzzled about it. And looked around and found in the forest there was a great horned owl. When the great horned owl left, the crows came back. So I think that's what it is. It's safety. They sleep there. They sleep there, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very spooky because, you know, you've got 13,000 crows making this big noise and all the rest, and then it goes absolutely silent, 
and you can walk underneath the trees and you look up and there's you know, 20, 30 crows in this tree and another 20, 30 there and they're everywhere and they're all sitting there with their wing, heads tucked under their wings and they're just out of, out of reach. It's so spooky. <laughs> How do the crows know where to look for the grub under the grass? How do they? You know how you see crows digging the grass and throwing it over their shoulder? How do they know where the bugs are? The question is, how, does he, how do they find the grubs? You mean the chafer beetles? That, that's a really good question. I think they're just tearing them up and looking underneath, because you'll see they'll tear it and they'll look. And so they've, they've I think so. I, I, I don't really know. I did. I, you know, th this was another question that's going to come up in this uh, crazy bird facts and fic fiction is, how do robins find worms? <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you. You have to come. <laughs> um, given their sociability and the system of kinship, is there anything special they do if a bird's been injured? Is there any sort of, sort of system of caregiving that you've noticed? Um, generally, no, it's the opposite. They attack them. Well, you often see that. I saw one that had a um, got a, uh, a COVID mask wrapped around its foot and was fl trying to fly, and they all attacked it. As soon as the the mask came off the foot, they just left it alone. So they seem to be going after them. But having said that, they um, there are a few stories of older crows that have been fed by some of the younger ones. So there could be something. And it might be something to do with the territory and trying to hold on to it, because that, that is, you know, if, if it's a yearling helper, they may not be nesting themselves, but it's their kin. They're related. So it is an advantage uh, evolutionarily uh, that those crows that are in the nest are going to be their, uh, you know, brothers or sisters. Um, I have a little story um, of um, a crow was on our lawn, and our lawn was pristine and it was going after the beetles. And uh, so my husband uh, went out and really uh, tried to scare his crow away. I know where this is going. <laughs> As he was going out, he also went into his car to go pick up some sushi about five kilometers away. And he went and picked up the sushi, went back towards his car, and a crow veered uh, down and atta attacked him. Is there any correlation between that same crow that he <laughs> and the one five kilometers away. Well, that, that's quite a ways, five kilometers, yeah, that they pass it on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's possible that it's the same crow because they do go, yeah, they go to shopping malls and sushi restaurants <laughs> to find food. So it could have been the same one. That, do they have, as you say, facial recognition? Like, uh, facial recognition to follow somebody? Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. You'll see people, you know, if they're feeding them, the crows will follow them and... Trail, trail them. They recognize cars, the color of the cars. Yeah, yeah you got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming around. Come around. On a couple of occasions, I've witnessed a crow laying down in an anthill, seemingly oh, yeah. bathing in ants. Oh, that's, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. A lot of birds do this. It's called anting, and they um, what they're doing is picking up the ants and then rubbing them on the feathers and they're getting the formic acid off the, the, off the ant. And they think that this is something to do with feather parasites. You know, birds have these feather mites and things. They think that might be something to do with this. But there's a really interesting twist. Of course, it's the crows. So, um, crows will also do this with cigarette butts. So they'll hold their wings over the cigarette butts and get the smoke. And they will also sit in chimneys when the smoke's coming up. And they'll spread out the same thing, same shape. They'll do. They'll get in the same posture as if they're doing this business with anting. There, there was a guy, I don't know if you saw it on the news a few summers ago, where he took a photo of that, and it went all over the, the, the internet. And all, and, yeah. um, but the really fascinating thing is that uh, in England, there's a uh, related bird called the chaff. They're related to crows, and they do this. They pick up the uh, cigarette butts and so on. I don't know if you, you know, probably don't remember this, but... Anne Hathaway's cottage, they were building the thatch. The, the, the thatchers, they were putting all this stuff on. One of the workers, at least they think this is what happened, one of the workers was smoking a cigarette, flicked the cigarette away, the chuff took it, flew it up onto the roof, onto the thatched roof, dropped it into the thatch, and the whole thing went up in flames. <laughs> 
There also are, um, I'm trying to remember the bird, there's one in Australia that actually takes burning embers and flies out and drops it on the grass to burn the grass and drive the, the um, small mammals out. And then they go and pick up the small mammals. They actually set the fire themselves. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, you were mentioning the Still Creek area. Uh, I live fairly close by there, so I, I see Perfect. them by the thousands over my house periodically. But the area where they seem to roost keeps changing. Every so often they go somewhere else. Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing is, is um, I think this was mentioned earlier, they aerate my lawn very well. <laughs> and uh, so it saves me a few bucks. That. <laughs> Good. But, um, yeah. And the other thing is I've been attacked a couple times by crows. Have you? Um, in two different areas. One in, uh, right in front of my house yep. from a nest across the street. And the other time, down in Forth and Burrard, mm -hmm. waiting for a bus. Oh. And this is during the breeding season when the young were coming I out? Can't remember in the, the summer? Time of year. I can't remember the oh, But somebody probably. was telling me that it was, uh, there was a nest close by. So yeah, that's probably it. Probably mating yeah. season. Yeah, the, the roost in Burnaby used to be up by BCIT, and then it moved down, and it was in behind the keg on the other side. And yeah, it does move around a bit. Yeah. Hi. I just want to ask, because um, of this facial recognition, how come people put scarecrows in farmers' fields, and were they effective? Yeah, they're, they're not terribly effective to, to do that. No, the, the crows can figure that out pretty fast. Some people have put, um, uh, like, um, they're not, they're not uh, crows themselves, but like a model of crows and put them on the lawns, and the crows get curious about it and wonder what's going on, and so it probably works a little bit, but yeah, they're not terribly effective. Yeah. We live on the north side of the Langara Golf Course. Okay. And fall and spring, there's a raven that comes visiting. The crows are there as well. Yep. What is the relationship? What's the relationship between a raven and the crows? The crows hate the ravens. Uh, so the raven, uh, if you, in case you don't know, the raven is about a, a third bigger than a crow. and has a wedge-shaped tail. It's much bigger. They tend to travel very, very far looking for food, often up high. You'll see them come by as pairs and rolling in the sky. And often, when they get down lower, <laughs> they'll be escorted by a bunch of crows. They're after the eggs and, and the small nestling crows. The ravens are moving into town as well. So in the past, there were very few. They're now nesting under bridges and so on. So they're making a, a move in. So it's a, like this dance that goes on between the two. But they're very closely related. They're in the same genus. It's just the two different species. Do the crows mainly take the eggs for food, or do they ever take the eggs so that they have young to raise themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, they're so secretive about this that we very rarely see it. But uh, it's been reported in, in, I think, 12 species of crows now. They all have those colored eggs, and they all report them losing them to other crows. I watch those nests so carefully, but a, a crow could get in and take one of those eggs and swallow it very fast, and I wouldn't see it because it would come out of the shrub already. But to give you an idea of how intense this is, it's about every 20 minutes, there's a crow trying to get into the nest. So the males are, it, they, they do all the guarding. The males are very, very hard pressed. They have to chase those ones out, get food for themselves and for their mate. And so you can see how difficult it is for them. It's really, really tough. One of the thoughts we had originally was maybe the females are doing this, that if the male doesn't feed them, she takes the last egg and eats it herself. But there's no indication of that in anything. So we're pretty sure that's what it is. You can also do little experiments with uh, um, plasticine eggs and put them in and you can see the bill. They'll drop them because they can't eat them. And you can see the, the bill shape so you know which one took it. Um, you were t talking about, I don't know if it's middle match or niddle match, M or N uh, yeah, islands, uh, and your pictures were from a number of years ago. Yeah. What are these stats now? Uh, sometimes you hear that birds really increase or maybe they stop going there all together after that many years. What, what is the story? 
This could be a whole new talk. <laughs> uh, the changes in bird numbers. So um, in the case of middle natch, the um, numbers of nesting seabirds has generally gone down. So it was at its peak when I was there. Um, they, and the number of crows has also gone down. The number of eagles has gone up, and the number of ravens have gone up. The eagles are now nesting on middle natch, and so are the ravens. And so there's this whole dynamic that goes on. But this is a natural process that takes place, and that's why I say it could be a whole uh, talk for you folks. Um, this is between predators and prey, and, and the game that kind of goes on between them and how they do this. The, the classic one is the study in Yellowstone when they put the wolves back into Yellowstone National Park, and how that had a trickle-down effect through the whole ecosystem. And it's just the presence of those predators scared the living daylights out of the elk, and the elk stopped feeding in places. The shrubs grew, came back, the beaver came back for the shrub. They built lodges and dams, in came new insects, and the whole park changed, even the geology of the park, just by the presence of those, those uh, wolves. So think of it here with the eagles. You know, we went through that period of DDT and very few eagles. When I was a kid, there were half a dozen nests here around Vancouver. Now they're everywhere. The eagle numbers have come back, and everything has to respond to that. They're going in after the crow nests and everything else. So there's a whole change and a dynamic, and this is perfectly natural. And I look at it as a good news story that you know, we're just getting back to a different uh, balance. But this happens across the whole hemisphere. It changes the migration routes and where birds go and how fast they fly, how much weight they carry. Everything changes because of the presence of those predators. You uh, commented on uh, how smart uh, the crows are. And I mean, if I was going out to, to the roost, I would need to use a GPS. And they could get there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did they just follow the leader? or? Are they all able to... You mean down to the roost? Own, to go to the roost, yeah. I think they probably know the route. Yeah, they, they just follow the sky train. <laughs> <laughs> and you also mentioned in, this, in the same vein of uh, intelligence, uh, the caches that, where they would bury them. Right. And then they're able to retrieve them you know, at different times of the year, like later on? Like that was the case of those pinion jays. With the, with the crows, they retrieve them all, most of them within 24 hours. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. I know, you know, if you have more questions, perhaps um, you can stay for just a few minutes, but I want to... Uh, wrap up, so it's almost 2 o'clock, and thank you so much. Rarely have we had so many questions from so many people about a topic, so it was really, really interesting and relevant to all of us here <laughs> living in this area, for sure, and we so, so appreciate you coming. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Have a great day.